awesome, awesome, awesome job. Thank you. Wow. And how about the worship team this morning, as always? So good. So good. Such a blessing. You know, waking up, that is the power of the resurrection. The resurrection has the power to wake us up from darkness to light, the power to wake us up from death to life. And that's what we're celebrating today. I was telling the people I ran into before the service, I was saying, you know what, we canceled church today. We're just throwing a party for Jesus instead. <laughs> Amen? It's like a Super Bowl. You, you've seen the Super Bowl parade and party where they say, hey, New, New England or whatever, Kansas City. Kansas City, yay, everybody cheers. This is such a bigger deal than that. This is a party. He is risen. He is alive. Come on, church. He's alive, right? He's alive. <laughs> Amen. You know, what, you know what hallelujah means, right? Um, if you don't, today's a great day to learn it. <laughs> Hallel means praise. Yah is short for Yahweh. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. He's risen, giving us hope, giving us life, giving us life. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to keep you engaged here for a little bit, and then I'll, then I'll talk for a while. All right. I'm going to say he is risen, and you're going to say hallelujah, knowing what it means, right? Knowing what it means. He's alive. He is risen. Hallelujah. You know, I can't even do it again. That was perfect. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to say this isn't a responsive reading because I thought, oh, the first time they won't get it, but you nailed it. That was just fun. Let's do it one more time. He is risen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Awesome. He is risen. Here's the truth. I'm not going to do a bunch of teaching today. I'm not going to do a bunch of apologetics today. If anything, what, what my desire today and the greatest prayer I have had all week is that we would walk out of here believing in a bigger and more powerful God than when we walked in. Amen? At Rise MKE, we believe in a big, huge God, but we remind each other of that every week. And that's what we want to do today, is just remind each other of what a big, powerful, and awesome God that we serve. And if I can use this time, this little bit of time, to just shake our souls into realizing it, let's wake up. Let's be aware of the power we have through Jesus Christ, the forgiveness we have through Jesus Christ, the fresh start we have through Jesus Christ. Wake up, like shaking us by the collar of our soul, right? Um, when Zach, my sons, Zach and Shane, have a, have a cousin who, uh, when he was younger, he's a great guy. We love him, by the way. But to tell him the story, um, he, he's, he is a great guy. I love, love, love their cousin, my nephew. But when he was younger, he was less than animated. He would, like, walk into a room and wouldn't say much. And my boys are talking and playing and doing stuff. And he was in a new environment, too. So he just wasn't saying much a couple times he came over. And finally, I think, I think he was about five or maybe six, and my youngest son, Shane, was like four. And I think that he was just like, he wanted to get him engaged. He wanted to kind of get him woken up, get a response from him, right? And so he, I just remember he ran across the room without saying a word, and he just shook him by the collar. <laughs> it's like, like, come on. That's what I want us to do today. I want today to be my version of coming across the room and shaking you by the collar because he is alive. Amen. Amen. Good. That was good. A couple of you got it. Amen. <laughs> he is alive. All right. We're going to keep shaking you by the collar. Don't worry. We'll, we'll keep going. All right. Got a question for you. What is the first image that comes to your mind when you hear the name Jesus? We all have an image. It's the first image. All right. I was thinking you'd do it quietly, but that's okay. I, I just shook your collar. We got <laughs> I just shook your collar. It's good. It's good. <laughs> Whatever. All right. <laughs> we'll just roll with it. Here's what I hope it isn't. Let me ask you this. Here's what I hope it isn't. I hope it isn't that painting. Those of you in my generation... Do you remember the paintings they used to put out of Jesus? The passive little Jesus, like this. Yeah. Remember that? Hi, hi, my name's Jesus. <laughs> that is not Jesus Christ, I promise you. 
And I, I think sometimes in our minds and in our hearts, we have tamed him. We have tamed him. And yes, he's kind, he's compassionate, but he's not weak. He's not placid. He's not effeminate, if I can say that. And he's not timid. He's none of those things. Jesus Christ is a warrior. A warrior who burst out of that grave to defeat death and sin on our behalf. He is our warrior God. And I think too many of us have made him too weak in our minds and our hearts. And because of that, our prayers are weaker. Our faith is weaker. And we, don't, we, we hope he can do something. He is powerful. And whatever you walk in, wherever you walked in here today, believing about God, it's my prayer that we all walk out thinking and believing and trusting in a bigger God. Because the, any, the bigger we can make him, the closer we are to reality. Because he is powerful. I want to open this morning with a quote from our King of Kings, Jesus Christ, Revelation 1, 17b and 18. These are the words of Jesus. Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Amen? Amen? That is our God. That is our God. How amazing is that? He is risen, he's the living one, and he is living forevermore. And so will all of us who put our faith in him. It is Jesus that has the keys to death and to Hades. I've always kind of grew up thinking that Satan was kind of in control of hell, right? He gets thrown into hell, and then he's in charge down there. No. There is no domain anywhere that Jesus Christ isn't completely in charge of, and he doesn't even lend the devil the keys. And Satan doesn't get to determine your eternal destiny. Jesus Christ does. And if you put your faith in him, that can't be touched. That cannot be touched, period. One more thing I want you to do. I'm going to keep engaging you for a little bit here. I'm going to ask everybody just to take a deep breath. Just exhale and then real deep. And exhale. That feels good, doesn't it? It feels good. It relaxes you a little bit. It feels good. The only reason you were able to take that breath is because Jesus Christ allowed you to. When's the last time you even thanked him for a breath? I know I don't. He is the one that granted us. He breathed life into us, and he has granted us every breath since. It's a gift, and he wants to continue to breathe life into us every single day. Again, my prayer is that we would walk out of here today seeing Jesus as he really is, powerful, awesome, life-giving God, because that's who he is. No matter what you're walking through, you have hope. Because he will breathe life into you, and he will walk you through. And you will persevere trusting him. Let's pray before we look in the word of God this morning. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you. You are so good. And we are so grateful for you. And Lord, as we look into your word, I just pray, God, you'd open up our hearts and our minds to see the amazing truth of the fact that you are, were dead and you're now alive. And that you reign over all. And there's nothing and no one like you. And we just pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Luke 24, 1 through 12 says this, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day? Rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and the mother of Mary James and ja mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking. In, he saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Jesus' body was laid in a tomb in a cave. 
And they were, the people were very afraid. The authorities were very afraid that it would get stolen and they were, some kind of prank would be played or something. And so they, they went ahead and rolled a stone. Most scholars believe it's between one and two tons. And it was one of those rolling stones, almost like a, 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 like a t- picture of a wheel, you'd say. And they rolled it. And it's, it's made such that they could go slightly downhill and it was grooved such that it would fit in and two men could probably roll it down but it's virtually impossible to remove once it was in place, once the momentum stopped and it locked in the front of that cave. God loves the word impossible, doesn't he? God loves the word impossible. And so what happens? The women arrive to apply spices to the body. He's no longer there. Then they ran and told the apostles. And we see here that Peter ran to the tomb. If you look at John's gospel, he reports that he ran too. They both ran together. In fact, John reports that I beat Peter. I ran faster than him. Love how he had to put that. That's, that would be my gospel if I put it in there. <laughs> so I ran faster. I, I, by the way, I was first. So, <laughs> so John beats Peter, but they both get there. And what do they see? They see these cloths that he, that he had been wearing on his body. In, somewhere in a pile, and then the one that was covering his head was folded neatly in a different place, it says. Folded neatly. And that's all they saw. They saw, they saw his clothes, but Jesus was gone because he's risen. He's gone. He's, he's never going to go in that tomb again. But here's the thing. That's all they saw in that tomb. But that's not all that was Jesus left behind in that tomb, amen? Jesus left death behind in that tomb. Jesus left condemnation behind in that tomb because the Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus left impossibility in that tomb because Jesus says all things are possible with God. At least that's what the Bible says, which I think is all his word, right? And so, so he left these other things in the tomb. And as we, as we go through this message, at the end of this message this morning, maybe there will be some other things we discover that he left in that tomb that simply don't apply to our life because we're in Jesus Christ. Because victory and hope and power is the life we're designed to live as Christians. On Friday evening, we talked about three kinds of death. We talked about physical death, which is separation from people. We talked about spiritual death, which is separation from God. And we talked about eternal death, which is separation from people and God forever. And as much as Good Friday is understandably has a focus on death, because that's when Christ died for us, it's Sunday. Sunday has arrived. Amen? It's Sunday. Amen? Amen. I thought so. (laughs) Sunday has arrived. And, and, and we are alive because he lives. And I'm going to talk about three different aspects of life, our new life in Jesus Christ. Now, these aren't three separate things. There is a lot of intermixing with them, so I'm not trying to break them apart at all. Sometimes you do a message of three points, and they all seem separate. This is all part of that new life we have in Jesus Christ. Three kinds, three, three, three aspects, I guess I could say, of life. One is new life. The life we have with Christ is new. It's not like our old life. It's abundant. We have abundant life. And third, we have eternal life. New life. The old is gone. The new has come. According to the strong concordance, the the meaning of that, that word means, for new, means recently made, fresh, recent, unused, unworn, unprecedented, novel, uncommon, and unheard of. New. This is a whole new life. Something that was never available. Before Jesus Christ, people didn't get a new life, right? We get a new life when we put our faith in Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. If anyone, I love that, if anyone is in Christ. That means no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter the sins you've committed, no matter how dark or badly you feel about yourself, if you turn to Christ and say, Jesus, forgive me my sins, please come and be my Savior, you will be forgiven and restored and made to be a child of God. Anyone, if anyone is in Christ, there's there's no set resume for what you have to do to belong to Christ other than say, Jesus, please come into my heart. That's it. That's it. 
He has, he has saved and redeemed the darkest of sinners. And no sin is beyond the cross of Christ. None of them. So if you put your faith in Christ, Jesus left in the grave for you, your old self. Now, we don't always believe that. We still have our bodies. We still have our thought patterns. We still have these things. And, and we got to work it out sometimes because as Christians, it doesn't mean it's easy and we don't sin because we most certainly do. But he has given you life. He has given you the ability to allow him to continue to transform you in your new life because that is not you. It is your new self. It is not your identity anymore. However you framed yourself, however early in life, whatever's happened to you to allow you to form your identity about yourself, when you put your faith in Jesus, it changes. It changes. Rich, poor, black, white, athlete, scholar, executive, laborer, male, female, one parent, two parents, married, single, divorced, widow, none of that defines you when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. You are a child of God, and there is nothing like it. You're royalty. You went from whatever you thought you were to royalty, not because of anything we did, but because of what he did on the cross, and he says so. He's the one that gets to decide. He made us. He saved us. He certainly gets to label us, right? He says we're his child. That's what he says. Your new creation in Christ, the child of God, royalty. Romans 6, 4 said we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. New life. The old is gone. The new has come. Abundant life. Life beyond measure. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that may, they may have life and have it abundantly. Parason means, this is the word, means very highly, beyond measure, more, superfluous, a quantity so abundant as to be considerably more than one, one would expect or anticipate. Abundant life. Life pouring into you so it can pour out of you. It is, there is no shortfall when it comes to ab abundant life. Now, one thing I should clear up before we start picturing, okay, I'm going to put my faith in Jesus, and then I'm going to have a lavish home, an expensive car. should probably clear this up a little bit before we get those pictures in our mind. The Bible tells us that wealth and prestige and position and power in this world do not impress him. He, they're not particular priorities of his, and he gives us no promises about them. So if you hear preaching that says, put your faith in Jesus, you'll get abundant life, and he will bless you abundantly, he may. He may in the material world. He may not. But here's what he will bless. Here's where you will get abundant life. That's in the fruit of the Spirit. He will give you himself, and the Holy Spirit will bless you abundantly. Would you rather be rich, or would you rather have peace? Would you rather have material stuff, or would you rather have love? What would you rather have? This is where he says that you will have it abundantly. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. Think of that abundance in love. So much love that I've got to share it. And then I can go to bed at night saying, you know what? This was an awesome day. I love them like I didn't even know I could. Patience. You know what? The person blew up at me, and I actually held my tongue. For once, I actually held my tongue and did the right thing. I walked away thinking, you know what? I didn't let it get to me. Gentleness, self-control, all these things, an abundance of these things in our lives are available to us. Again, we got to continue to grow in them. we got to continue, and we can't put them on. They're only fruit of the Spirit. So we can't manufacture these things in our life no matter how hard we try, but we have Christ when we put our faith in Jesus, we rely on him. Our job is to stay close to him. Our job is to allow the spirit to lead and control our life. Then, then this fruit will come through our lives to his praise, not to ours, not because we work hard and not because of the things we do. The fruit of the spirit is from the spirit. It's from God himself. Three kinds of life, new life. The old is gone, the new has come. Abundant life, life in which we're overflowing with the fruit of the Spirit. And finally, the third aspect, that new life we have when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, is eternal life. Eternal life. Life in communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how I 
narrowed it down to. You can come up with a lot of different definitions for eternal life, but the one thing I want to emphasize, it's more than just time. I mean, a very cool aspect of eternal life is you have it forever. I won't, die, I won't lie. I like the fact that I don't have to worry about death because I'm going to live forever. It doesn't matter. If I die, that's my tent, right? And the rest of me, I'm with Jesus. He's with us to the grave. Every breath, every breath he's given you and he's with you. And then once, we're, once we die, we don't die. Our body dies. And we spend eternity with the king of kings. That's, that's eternal life. But eternal life is so much more than that timeline. It's, it's really, it, it, no matter how many ways I look it up and how many scholars write things on it, it's linked inextricably with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's living in communion with Jesus. The resurrection was a victory over sin and death and provides us an opportunity to get right with God. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Love. The gospel is a message of love. We've blown it. Who hasn't blown it? Every one of us have sinned. And a holy God is not going to sit and pretend sin is okay. And we wouldn't want him to. We think this world is screwed up now. You ought to see it if God tolerated sin. He doesn't. But here's the thing. He did not want our eternal destiny to be apart from him. John 17, 3 says, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So God's heart is for us to know him. God's heart is simply for us to come to him and get to know who he is personally. That's it. That's it. Because our sin has separated us from him. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. And then, people always giggle when I, when I talk about a but in the scripture. The, the best but in scripture is this. For the wages of sin is death, but... The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He is risen, and he's alive, and he has now his, his spirit roams this world. He wants to bring more people to himself. There are people that don't know him, and they don't really even get that they could be forgiven. I, I swear, that's why many, keep many people away from God. They honestly don't even know for sure they can be forgiven. And so what do they do? They stay away because they don't want to be left feeling guilty. Yes, confess our sin, but then let's say, ask Jesus for forgiveness, and he will forgive it us immediately. That's what he does. He says, I will move your sin as far as east is from the west. You can come to me. He's saying, if you come in here today and you don't know me, he's saying to you, you can trust me. Trust me. Come to me. Admit the fact that you're a sinner. Invite me into your life. And I will bring you life like you've never known it. I will bring you new life. I will bring you abundant life. I will bring you eternal life. And it's one move of your heart away just to say yes to Jesus Christ. That's all it takes. It's not a bunch of rules. It's not, it's not about what you do. It's simply saying, Jesus, I'm with you. I want forgiveness. Please give me forgiveness. And he says yes. And then, then John 14, 19c, a form of which we sang earlier, will apply to you. Because I live, you will live also. That's what he says to you. Because I live, you will live also. If you've not put your faith in Jesus Christ, I'm giving you an opportunity to do it right now. And for the rest of us, Let's try to remind each other often, all right, how big God is. Let's remind each other he's powerful. Let's remind each other when we walk through hard stuff who Jesus Christ is and how he is going to help you through it. We are going to move forward in our lives with power, not because of us, because of him. He is able and he is alive. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. Lord, you are alive, and we praise you for that. We don't pray to a dead God. We don't pray to a ceiling in a room. We pray to a living God who is all-powerful and can do all things. And, Father, I just pray to you that if there's anyone in here that does not know you, I pray, Father, in this moment that they would say yes to you. 
I pray, God, if there's anyone who has not said yes to, even if they've gone to church a lot or, or maybe they haven't, maybe they're just here because somebody invited them, but they sense you talking to them in this moment, I pray, God, just between you and them that they would pray this prayer. God, I love you. I need you. I recognize that, I'm, that I've sinned. And I don't even know for sure what all this is about, but I do know that I can't do this on my own. And I don't feel close to you, and I want to. And so I ask for forgiveness for my sins. Jesus, I ask that you come into my heart and be my Savior. And I ask, God, that you just show me how to live this new life that's being talked about today. And I pray, God, that you would help me. Forgive me, lead me, and show me the way from here on in. If anyone prayed that prayer, you are redeemed, you are restored, your, your life is changed forever, and you have got new life. You've got abundant life. You've got eternal life. All because Christ the Lord is risen today. Amen? Amen. Amen.